questions for this. So uh, I was just giving a couple of minutes to allow people to join, but uh, mindful of everybody's time as well. So uh, we might just get started. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Catherine Heffernan. I'm the uh, chair of Meet Business Women Australian Territory, and I'm also the general manager for communications and media at AMIC, the Australian Meat Industry Council, of which we're the uh, exclusive Australian Territory partner of Meet Business Women. I would also like to show my respect and acknowledge the Kamaragal people of the Garingai Nation uh, from where I speak today as the traditional custodians uh, of the land and I also acknowledge elders past and present. Um, I'm just going to flick through, uh, most of you may be aware of, sorry it's not clicking, there we go. Sorry, we're having a little bit of a control thing here. Um, I would also like to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, we have a number of global strategic members for Meet Business Women. Um, I'd like to call out in particular JBS Australia and Coles. And we also have uh, corporate country members in Australian Pork Limited and Sheep Producers. Uh, they are on the call today. And I would like to say a huge thank you to our supporters, uh, of which a lot of these events uh, are not possible, uh, and also some great events coming up uh, now that we can get back to face-to-face. -to -face. So thank you for that support. Uh, for those that aren't aware and have come on here as a bit of a free event for Meet Business Women, this is a global networking uh, organisation uh, founded out of the UK. It gives you exclusive access to regular uh, monthly masterclasses that are usually exclusively for members. It has a lot, a lot of great industry content, resources, uh, gives you full access to a lot of relevant industry documents. We also have a global mentoring platform where we can match mentors and mentees together if you, no matter what stage you are at in your career. Uh, some great, it's a really great platform to get involved in. And then we also do a gender representation report on the meat sector. The last one was done in 2020. Uh, the UK team are planning on rolling out one uh, this year, the first quarter of this year, uh, second quarter of this year. Um, so look out for some surveys that are becoming your way where they'll be looking uh, at getting some more updates on the benchmarking in terms of stats, which pretty much shows that around 5% um, of women actually sit in CEO or executive roles uh, in the meat industry. So that's just a very broad um, brushstroke on um, meat business women. Alex will just uh, pop into the chat the website uh, for uh, where you can find out more around membership. Uh, today we have a really great uh, program uh, lined up for you. Um, I would like to thank um, Georgie Somerset, uh, Senator Susan McDonald and Dr Jamie Manning uh, who are joining us today. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Georgie Somerset. Uh, Georgie is a rural industry leader and strategist with a background in regional development across Australia. Uh, Georgie's based on her family's cattle property in Queensland, uh, South Burnett, and she's actively involved in the operation of multi-generational family beef business. For three decades, Georgie has juggled the demands of beef production alongside her roles in many influential organisations, and Georgie's passion for advocating for rural Australia and her service to primary industries, women and the community, uh, saw her named a member of the Order of Australia in 2020. Uh, Georgie's kicking off our Get a Theme, a Getting It Done theme with Get Heard, um, how to make women's voices count inside the meat industry and the role that women can play in advocating uh, for the sector across the wider ag industry and beyond. Uh, Georgie's going to explore what advocacy is, uh, why it matters when you're busy trying to just get through your day, uh, where women can make the most difference and why the post-COVID environment will provide some opportunities for change. So welcome, Georgie. Thanks, Catherine, and great to be with you all today. I'd just like to pay my respects also to um, Elders Past, Present and Emerging, and particularly with a focus today on those emerging. I'm The, the photo in the background is from my property, which is in the Waka Waka country, um, but I'm coming to you today actually from Gadigal country in the Eora Nation. Um, I'm really excited about what Meet Business Women is doing, and I'd really like to 
just explore some things around advocacy today. And I think it's exciting that so many women have chosen to register and participate in this, um, but also the opportunities that Meet Business Women um, provide for you. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, just rolling through and in looking at advocacy and what is it, um, I think that we often look at legacy advocacy and we think about the traditional ways of, of being heard. And you'll, I've got photos there of what's happened in the past. And we stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before us. We wouldn't have AMIC, who are a partner of um, Meet Business Women, if we didn't have the leadership that's been provided over the last 100, 150 years. Um, but I'm going to talk also about how some of the things have changed in the future. So here's some, some photos of some of our leaders in the past and, and the things that they've done. But in the future, I think what we're moving towards um, is new ways of doing advocacy and new ways of influencing. And this is where I think that women play such a significant role um, that we're, we're less interested in being part of traditional organisations and investing time in meetings and more in having conversations and growing things into the future. So just on the next. Thanks, Alex. So looking at new ways of advocacy, and I've, I've got up here um, some, some images that, um, you know, the, the top slide is of presenting to actually, and you'll hear from Senator McDonald, but the truth in labelling, um, Senate inquiry, actually being part of that, but being able to do it remotely. Um, the one with, with host farms, looking at farm holidays, how do they influence how people are thinking about, um, for me, agriculture and particularly the meat industry? And how do we connect people and have conversations more deeply about what we do? And I see that agritourism and farm tourism can be an, an amazing um, tool in that. And I've actually been involved in it for 35 years, but I see it having a resurgence around how we participate in that. Down the bottom is, and, and Jamie will know about the um, Kids to Farms, which Central Queensland University are also involved in, um, connecting our young people and going into schools and talking about agriculture. And then the largest image there of the, the, the Kelpies and Mustard Dogs, a TV show that wasn't designed around advocacy, but has done so much to start conversations with people who are really interested in knowing what we do on properties and how we're working our stock. And I think that we, we sometimes find things in really unusual places. And that's what I'd like all of you to think about. How can you be advocates in unusual ways? So the next slide. If we're, and, and, and I think that women play a really great role in being able to do this. I've been involved in a whole range of things. And this is back to some traditional things where we talk about um, taking up the fight and farmers taking to the street and doing billboards. But moving on to the next slide, what I really want to see is how women get involved in changing the conversation in all sorts of different ways. This is an education slide from, from um, different displays. So one's in the Queen Street Mall in Brisbane, the Main Street in Brisbane, where we were actually able to put augmented reality headpieces on people and take them mustering on properties. The others are of a, a beef week, actually taking students through science connected to agriculture, talking about um, one, there's a, a mock auction of an auctions plus, using different ways of advocating to connect and build our messages. Years ago, I learned that ethical decisions about pr professions are made by the time we're about nine or 10 years old. And so the importance of us actually connecting with schools and school children and young people is absolutely critical because that's when they're making decisions, not only about their careers, but actually about how they view industries and how they view professions. And so it's critical that we get involved in those and we need more and more people to be involved in advocating for education. On the next slide. <clears throat> how do you get heard? So on the left here are the really traditional things and we need to work with those systems. AMIC is built upon organisations like the one in the top left corner, which is actually the foundation of the National Farmers Federation, um, which is a peak industry organisation like AMIC and works really closely with AMIC. And below it, Parliament House, looking from old Parliament House to new Parliament House in Canberra. They're really critical organisations that you need to get involved in because this is where decision makers um, have conversations and build legislation from. 
But just as importantly on the right-hand side is building alliances beyond our industry. Uh, so one photo there is of me um, with other industries, with the tourism sector, with the construction sector, with the engineers profession, with the mining industry, having that collaboration where we actually work together. It's really critical that you not you, you find your place of how you can get heard in those in those different um, focuses. In the bottom right is my home, and that's what drives me: is how do we make this better for all of those in our industry, and for those of us that can find a voice, how do we improve it for those that don't have a voice? So how do we enable others as well as taking their message through? that if we end up being the one involved in AMIC, how do we always ensure that others in the meat industry are at the centre of what we're thinking about? Other women are at the centre of what we're thinking about. And it's just critical for me that we always have, what I talk about is in an, as a member organisation, is a member-centred focus and how do we make it better for members? But I, I don't want you to walk away thinking that legacy organisations aren't critical because they are for the structure of our industry and how we get decisions um, made. And they're also really important at times um, of crises when we actually have to um, deal very quickly and very efficiently with a lot of information and get that out to a lot of people. And we have an incredible democracy in Australia and I really respect um, Australian democracy and, and the system we have through our parliament. And what I really encourage you to do is get involved in that process. And I know Senator McDonald will talk more about that. Um, so on the next slide, finding your voice is, is really um, sometimes really challenging. Um, there's social media, um, there's being out there and uh, travelling the land, there's finding your tribe and the photo in the middle is, um, Catherine will be in that photo, I think the, it's from the Australian Farm Institute's uh, policy day earlier this year. We had so many women in the room on the eve of International Women's Day, where while it wasn't an International Women's Day for function, probably 50% of the women in that room, uh, well, 50% of the audience were women. And that's what excites me, is that women in agriculture and women in the um, meat industry are finding their voice and they're getting involved in things. I really encourage you to find your voice on social media in a way that works for you. It's a way that's genuine and authentic, and, it, and that it has a degree of understanding and kindness. There are a lot of people really interested in what we do in our industry, um, and we can be quick sometimes to judge them because of their lack of understanding. So when you're engaging on social media, I just really encourage you to be as explanatory and take others on the journey as you can. Um, but I also know that people want to stand up for their industry and stand up for what they believe in, but I ask you to do that in a really kind way. I encourage you to find your tribe um, and yes the silo art is amazing so I really love that we can um, combine things in rural communities that um, that get our message across about what we're doing um, but you also do need to be out in the ground and you need to have the conversation with plenty of people and not be afraid to have those conversations so just on to the next slide these are my points for you so but work for you what is your story every one of us is different and unique and don't try and be I love the expression of you know an apple is a great apple and if a plum tried to be an apple it'd probably be a half rate apple so be the best you can be at your story you'll all have a unique story about your engagement in our industry um, and and that's and help you can find others to help you build that story um, but it is your story Invest in yourself. Look, by turning up and watching this, um, you're investing in yourself. But I really encourage you to do as much as you can to build your own skills and your capacity. Building your network. Um, meet businesswomen. That's why I'm really excited because I think building your network, I, um, everything has its time, but I'm really excited about the networks that are available and the access to information and the fact that we've got virtual functions like this where you can not only invest in yourself, but you can build your network through this. You can follow up um, with the speakers, with other participants. Um, you can continue this discussion in, the, um, in your own offices by taking some of the key themes out of this. But build your network and make sure you build it outside of just the meat industry as well. Um, 
don't don't remain in a silo, but build it and strengthen it outwards so that you've got strong connections. Turn up. You've turned up today. You're watching this. That's part of turning up. And then the final one is you really need to speak up. Decisions are made by those who turn up. But often I see people turning up to things and not having anything to say. So spend time, please. Spend time, please, um, speaking up, not like the fire alarm in the background, um, but finding your voice and then speaking up when you turn up. Find the courage to put together the questions you have. Approach the speaker that you want to speak to. Find someone in the audience but make sure that you use the time that you're investing to not only turn up as part of your network, as you invest in yourself, but to make sure you speak up. I'm really excited about where Meet Business Women um, Australia is heading and the networks that you're building. And I really look forward to hearing from many of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgie. Um, I really loved the point you made around the socials, uh, using that to your advantage, not only to actually share your voice, your passion, but you can be passionate, but also very kind and authentic in, in how you speak. So uh, that really resonated with me. Sometimes we all get caught up in debates and, and conversation, but it, should, yeah, it can be very positive one. Thank you. Um, I've just welcomed and a little hi from Joe Palmer there. Hi, Georgie. Hey, Joe. Um, uh, very open, very casual. Uh, you're welcome to uh, pop on here and raise your hand or just speak up or pop a question in the chat. We'll just do a quick Q&A after each speaker. So if you've got any questions or comments for Georgie that you'd like to say, I'm happy to facilitate those. I might get off lightly, Catherine. I think the kindness <laughs> thing on social media is really critical for me. Um, I spend a bit of time curating the messages that I put on there and I used to be really active on Twitter um, but I, I find and, and I'm really impressed by some of our advocates on there um, but I do think this takes time it's not a, um, a fly in the minute sort of quickly done thing um, for me it's about being quite thoughtful about how you engage and I guess I'm um, I engage with different groups of people in different social media as well and I think that's important as well um, you know, LinkedIn is a very different space, but I find it really useful for having more thoughtful conversations and sharing really interesting um, documents and articles as well. Yeah, exactly. And I met you, obviously, now that we got out of COVID uh, at, as you said, the, um, the Farm Institute uh, conference. And uh, I liked your comment about, you know, when I was starting out and you were young in the industry, you kind of, you went to these events, but you sort of sat back and you didn't work the room or you didn't go up and introduce yourself. And it's something that comes with a bit more confidence as you get older. And I liked that point in courage. If you're going to be at the conference then get out, introduce, network, have conversations, meet the people Look, that you want to meet. And my experience is it doesn't come as naturally to women. So we have to work a bit harder. Um, I, I once had a minister say to me that when they went to a function, they'd have, you know, 10 or 20 men press their business card to them and say, let me know when you've got some opportunities, but they'd rarely have a woman come up to them. And I thought, you know, it's not just ministers, it's actually most. And, and women, uh, I read something last night where women often stand in circles, whereas men stand in horseshoes. So try practicing standing in a horseshoe where someone else can enter the circle, someone else can join the conversation or um, look for those that aren't talking to anyone and go and approach them yourself it's not always comfortable but I think it really expands our own networks yeah very good tips um hello Amy Brooks over also in the uh South Burnett uh has done a shout out to you Georgie uh, thanking for acknowledging uh, the traditional owners over there uh, Amy Brooks is a committee member for Meet Business Women in Australia so hi Amy still haven't met in person looking forward to doing that soon uh, Donna has uh, said hi from Bindere Food Group over in Inverell, New South Wales. Um, uh, Anik, Anika, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, has asked, do you have any tips for growing a social media presence? Uh, social media is social, so it's about engaging. It's not, um, it's not a sit and be silent media. So your... Um, audience will grow with the engagement so the conversations the comments the asking questions of others um, getting involved I've made some great friends on social media and I um, you know I think that for all its negatives it's also allowed me to build some really great connections um, and I sort of look at it as a water cooler I work 
um, you know, from home a lot of the time. And so you, you know, you can go and hop on social media, it's a water cooler, you get a bit of a feel of what's going on out there and then you can, um, you know, go back to your life. But I think you've actually got to engage with social media for it to be effective. Yeah, great. And any suggestions on how you can grow your connections with people outside of this industry? Oh, well, I, I actually seek them out. So I look for them and I message people and I turn up to things. Um, you know, this year I went to the company directors uh, governance summit in person. And I think it's about going to things that aren't necessarily about agriculture or meat, but they're of interest to you. And what I find there is people are quite surprised when you say you work in agriculture or um, the meat industry and they sort of have some preconceptions, but you end up with some really great conversations because you're not with your own tribe. Um, and you, you have to explain what you do and why you do it. Uh, last year, I was on a panel at the mining lunch and I got to talk a lot about um, you know, access engagement and, and talking with producers and how we perceive it. Mm. Yeah, great. And um, the, the balance between being active versus being obsessed, <laughs> any tips on how? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking that's in terms of social media. A um, question from Kelly McTavish. Okay, so if it's about social media, I think it's about balance and and absolutely that you, and, and in terms of um, some things you need to let go through to the keeper so you don't need to do everything. There's um, MLA are running a great Red Meat Ambassador program, which actually gives social media training and um, yes. some real skills around this with... Um, um, right social media um with Heidi Wright so I, I really recommend if people are interested in that that they look at accessing that Red Meat Ambassador program um, because you get some very specific skills about how to feel much more comfortable about um those conversations and and I think Kelly with get feeling like you dive in too deeply um just take a step back and also think well maybe this person is literally just a shopper and how would I so so um there's a great expression that if only one cow turns up for a feed, you don't feed them the whole truckload, you just give them a bale of hay. So maybe just feed them a bale of hay at a time and think about it in those terms that just, just give them a little bit um, and then if they're interested, they'll come back for more. That's great. Just one final little question that I saw in the, the link there and I think we touched on it before about, for me, myself as well, um, making those connections with confidence. What do you do if you're an introvert and you, you're not quite good at that any tips around oh look and and I'm I'm borderline so I feel for you as well um be prepared so have a think have a think about what are the things who are the people you want to target do your research read up on the people beforehand identify a couple of the people that you'd like to meet and dig deep and find your courage um look I um, I, I still get nervous sometimes at forums asking questions. I think that's really natural. Um, these days, a lot of it's uh, on the app, so you've got a chance to do it. Um, but I think you just have to actually prepare yourself. Um, and the more you can prepare yourself, I think the more confident you'll start to feel about the questions that you ask or approaching people and having a reason to come up and speak to them as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Georgie, for um, popping on. Obviously, you're going to stay around. There will be a bit of a forum at the end, some more discussion. So if you have any further questions on this, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll get to them towards the end on a bit of an open forum discussion. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Senator Susan McDonald. Um, Susan grew up on her family's cattle property 70 kilometres south of Cloncurry. Uh, she was educated by Correspondence School and Mount Isa School of the Air before going to boarding school in Brisbane. Her first job was cooking for a stock camp and working at Expo 88. I remember that <laughs> in Brisbane before going to the University of Queensland and studying accounting. Uh, Susan was elected to the Senate in May 2019 after securing the number two spot on the Queensland Liberal National Party ticket. She is currently the Special Envoy for Northern Australia, Chairman of the Federal Government's Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, and Susan chaired the recent Senate inquiry into meat labelling on the definitions of meat and other animal products. On the continuation of our theme, Susan's going to speak about getting up to speed. Uh, knowledge is power. Uh, Senator McDonald will provide updates on legislation, policy and personal insights on topics from meat packaging and labelling to encouraging innovation 
in staffing as the ramifications of a changed global talent pool start and continue to reverberate. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, everybody. And I'm just going to check that I'm unmuted and you can all hear me. Yes. Terrific, thank you. <laughs> we were discussing earlier that I'm going to uh, put out a range of T-shirts that says you're on mute, seems to be our most spoken phrase. So good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for putting this together. Uh, and to Jamie, uh, who I haven't met in person, and to Georgie, who it's always very tough, a tough act to follow Georgie Somerset, who has been a great advocate uh, both for the industry and for women in industry uh, for a while. So uh, great to be on at the same time. So I think that our industry, uh, meat and um, uh, agriculture broadly, and meat in particular, is, is the greatest uh, meeting to be uh, industry to be involved in. It is such a privilege to grow food for people. And so whether or not you're involved uh, uh, on a station or a farm growing the animal uh, through the processing industry, the distribution network or retail, uh, they are all equally important. Uh, agriculture is a really interesting industry. Uh, I deal now with lots of different uh, sectors, uh, aviation, only 7% of pilots uh, are women, only 4% of commercial pilots are women. Um, politics is not that dissimilar, though we're working on that. So, you know, we are really living through a very changed society about um, not just how many women are involved in different sectors, but at what level that they're engaged at. So leadership levels um, as well, and management levels, as well as uh, being in the industry more broadly. So uh, one of the things that I think we can be really excited about is post-COVID and the uh, equity of access that we have through virtual meetings. Uh, I think that uh, as I talk to people across regional Australia and Northern Australia, it's very exciting that I can pull together a group of um, of producers, of uh, regional development associations, councils, whoever it may be, right across the country, nobody has to leave their office or their home, uh, which means that our voice regionally and from this industry uh, grows and is, is equal now to the people who are in Sydney and Melbourne and Canberra, which I think is a really important change and one that we should be grasping. Uh, we also are living in a world where uh, we're living through what we're calling the great resignation. So uh, we are experiencing people reflecting on where they work and how they work and whether or not it gives them purpose and meaning. Uh, I think particularly if they've been working from home and missing the connection that they might have had with uh, colleagues previously, uh, this is a, a time that employers are really having to think about what is it that we do to attract uh, a workforce because we have workforce shortages right across the country in pretty well every um, in every industry that you can think of and it's going to take us a long time to to fill all of those roles which means that we're working um, more flexibly and more innovatively but I did see a business the other day that was now offering a uh, breakfast and lunch as a way to uh, to secure their workforce and I thought that was a terrific idea and again Coming back to what we do, growing and producing food, uh, nothing is more important to us uh, as humans. Um, so I think that that is something that uh, as, as women that we have uh, got some experience in is how to think differently about uh, the workplace that we're in uh, because we have to bring that flexibility, particularly if you've gone through having a family uh, you might have tried to work part-time or re-entering the workforce. And it was certainly something uh, that I went through. You know, I'm now 52. My children are, um, uh, are getting close to growing up. And, and so I remember those years of trying to maintain my career, uh, maintain my interests um, and engagement in, in uh, different sectors, as well as, you know, prioritising the little people that, um, that I love very much. So... That allows us to think differently. And a shout out to Joe Palmer, who um, I've been fangirling on for a couple of years because of her work on uh, how to engage uh, women who are working uh, remotely uh, around the country and what that means for the nation. 
the increase of productivity and uncapping the potential of, uh, of the GDP that would be available for more um, women who can work from, you know, cattle stations, remote towns, they might have moved somewhere with a partner, but still remain engaged in their, their particular industry. So I think that was a great piece of work. Uh, what I want to finally touch on is uh, how we can think more like retailers. So, <laughs> Joe, so uh, when I went into, I, I came off a cattle station, I'm an accountant by trade, because my mother said to me, do something uh, that, that um, is a skill that you'll always be able to work in, uh, no matter where you go, and accountancy has certainly been that. Um, but most importantly, um, and I've now... When I went into the retail industry, my brother and family had bought Super Butcher out of liquidation and, uh, and I was working uh, in a different industry and I went in to run that business. And I thought, how hard can it be? I'm an accountant and I love meat. I know about cattle. This will be all pretty straightforward. And of course, that was not the case at all. The retail sector is a particularly uh, fast paced um, uh, sector and in our meat industry, I don't think we think enough about selling the product to the consumer. We spend a lot of time talking about breeds um, and margin. We talk about um, uh, processing and margin. Uh, and they're, of course, very important. Um, and I did have a bit of a push for a while that we reduced the size of cattle down so that uh, you could go out and have a, you know, a a 250 or 300 gram T-bone if we're running low lines. Anyway, I got no traction on that at all. But my point is, is that as retailers, you start to think about your consumer, your marketplace, and, uh, and the people who make decisions about our industry. So women in the meat industry are another important step forward because we bring another point of view. If you were running a, a, a sporting team, you wouldn't have all goal attacks in netball, you wouldn't have all forwards in football. And like that in the meat industry, a range of views uh, and approaches is incredibly important. And it could not be more important than now where we are seeing a new, uh, a new environment of a people not understanding about how sustainable and healthy and nutritious red meat in particular is uh, to humans. We have spent thousands of years uh, being um, designed to do well on red meat um, and, and vegetables and a range of other foods. So to now see plant-based proteins make it push into the market, making uh, claims around sustainability is, I think, um, uh, something that we need to do more in uh, asserting the, the uh, nutrition, sustainability uh, employment and workforce uh, claims of the meat industry. So you don't need to be an expert in every sector um, when you're giving, um, when you're going to forums, when you're giving advice, uh, you just need to be interested and passionate. And, uh, and I agree with Georgie about, you know, in the beginning, it was really hard to walk up to a group and say, hello. Um, now I've got very good at it. And, uh, and, and it's amazing how Everybody has got something to offer in a conversation, has got a different point of view. I learned something in every conversation I have. Um, but I was really proud of the work that we did on the meat definitions inquiry. Uh, and I think it's something that we need to continue to hold the ground and hold the line on why this sector is so important um, to, to Australia economically, to the world economically, but also um, also nutritionally and as humans, uh, and we do so much. Um, we are doing so much in sustainability, uh, in nutrition, pasture production, uh, processing plants, uh, achieving carbon uh, emissions neutral targets. There is so much work going on and how we get that engagement across um, you know, every, every part of society. But I would also agree that, you know, the young people and the children are the ones uh, who are not necessarily getting that view anymore. And I'm very keen that we do. Um, so finally, uh, yes, speak, speak. Even when your voice is shaky and you feel nervous, 
that is probably the time that you've really got something that you've, you're passionate about that you need to say. Uh, remember that most other people in the room are thinking about what they're going to say next as well. They're also equally nervous. But when you've got something that you, you know and you're passionate about, uh, then that is, that is incredibly valuable and important. And uh, you may be saying the thing that four or five other people around the table wish they'd had the courage to say. And when you do, we'll say, oh, thank goodness, and, and listen intently to what the answer is. Um, but there are so many people across our sector, across uh, other industries as well, as Georgie's already said, that have something to offer um, and interesting um, views and, and allow us to engage better. And for that reason, I think that it's important to have more women in the meat sector, uh, more women engaging at, um, at every level and thinking more like retail. Who is our consumer? Whether it be at a retail level buying the product, at a government level setting guidelines and policy and legislation, um, or, um, or, or the community at large who sets social licence parameters. Uh, it is a very important bit of work. It's the reason why I stood for politics uh, is because I'd like to see uh, more butchers and more agricultural people um, lining up to, to push uh, the agenda. So uh, very grateful for your time today. And uh, thanks again, Catherine. Thank you, Senator. Um, fantastic, some really good insights there. I'm making my own little notes down. I'm just gonna open up um, to the chat. There's a couple of comments in there. One was around, uh, we need to be pushing the government harder for better childcare arrangements to not only get more women back into the workforce, but allow some financial independence also. Uh, that and a cooked lunch daily, <laughs> we would have it made. And somebody else said, made a comment about a, uh, one of their clients, a rural store offers a cooked lunch every day for their team, which is a really nice alignment with family values. I couldn't agree more about this part on childcare. It's really interesting. And again, this is what changes the discussion when you have more women in policy setting environments is that um, we understand the pressures of uh, trying to keep your family as a priority, uh, making sure that your children are raised in a safe and, and a place where you're having not just quality time, but quantity time as well. Uh, as well as be able to do your job and stay connected and productive and, and, um, and passionate about what you do. So childcare is a really important uh, a part and um, a, a longer conversation, but I, I hear you. Uh, a thanks from uh, Amy Brooks for sharing your story and standing in those cattle shoes, uh, <laughs> showing all women just what we can all achieve in this industry. Uh, a question, what would be your advice uh, for women who would like to make their way into politics to advocate for agriculture? Well, for starters, I would be uh, very grateful for more women uh, wanting to stand, in, um, stand up for politics because uh, there has been a bit of a dearth of, of uh, women, uh, particularly from regional Australia, because there is a sacrifice involved. Um, you know, I sleep in, in my house where my children... Uh, are mostly, you know, three or four nights a month. And I wish it was more than that, but I also have committed to a, a period of time to, to advocate for this job. Um, but it is important. It is so important because if we do not stand up and talk about what is real and what is practical and what is important, then we leave a vacuum and we leave a vacuum to be filled by people who have no idea. So um, I'm very happy for you to contact me uh, offline um, to have a longer conversation about how I could support you and, and give you advice. Um, but that would be the first one, is, um, is reach out to somebody who's already in the job, whether it be Georgie in agri-politics, whether it's me in, in the federal parliament, state parliament, council, all of these places set policy and regulation that are so important to our agricultural industry. Um, uh, there's, there's a Maribyrnong uh, Council just out of Melbourne is currently setting guidelines that will determine what your stocking rate is on properties and uh, whether or not you can um, bring on stock or what your planting regime may be. It's all around climate change. On what basis would council have the expertise to be doing that? Oh, I think that's extraordinary. And I think it's a case in point of them not having a broad enough representation on that particular 
um, that particular representative body. So get stuck in. Yeah. Another question, probably very topical as we're leading into the May election, um, the best way to actually reach out and engage with politicians and MPs, whether it's local, state or federal, is it email? Is it socials? What's the best way to make those connections? Uh, well, in the next three weeks, um, everybody is kind of a bit frantic and on the road. So um, I don't mean to sound uh, discouraging, but... Don't bother. Uh, yeah, well, no, no, that's, that <laughs> could be... Um, I, uh, I guess it's everybody's a bit different. So for me, um, uh, you know, LinkedIn is great uh, because I check that personally. Um, um, some of the other forums like Messenger and, and Facebook and whatnot get so crowded with, with it being an open platform. So I, I do find LinkedIn very good. Um, I would flag, like Georgie said about social media, I don't look at Twitter, Twitter anymore. There are so many great ag people on there that I love following their discussions but there is so much ugliness on that and um, I've had to counsel some of my staff because I'm just getting depressed at just some of the awful awful things that are said so be careful yeah. be careful on social media yeah very good um I think that there's a lot of thank yous in the chat uh, for you Susan uh, and all you do for Australian agriculture very nice um, couldn't agree more with the importance of diversity of thought. I think this applies across the industry, not just to women. What are your thoughts on inviting and encouraging experts and professionals from all backgrounds to help grow the industry? I think it's really important. I think that um, we have sometimes uh, got siloed and it means that we focus on how we do things, not why. And particularly, again, you know, back to my retail point about how we engage with our consumers, be they shoppers or be they decision makers. Uh, and so engaging with different industry groups is really important. I mean, the mining industry um, is one that has all the same challenges as agriculture currently. Um, there's a lot of alignments and we can learn a lot from how they, they try and speak with one voice uh, how they uh, advocate for um, industry, um, and and but there are plenty of sectors. I, I think you know the, the point earlier about childcare. You know that was a that's a point really well made. You know childcare and education and aged care um, in regions. Um, how we uh, bring together different challenges and different walks of life and talk about what their challenges are. It may not necessarily be something that we can always address, but it starts us thinking about, you know, what that might look like um, if we incorporated some of those needs into how we think about our own industry. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Senator, for your time, for those insights. Hopefully you can stick around uh, for yeah. our final speaker in a little forum at the end. Um, I'm going to now introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Jamie Manning. Um, Jamie is a lecturer um, at agri in agriculture at CQ University uh, Australia. She's based in the beef capital of Australia in Rockhampton. She lectures into the CQU agriculture degree program and her research focuses on issues facing rural, regional and remote communities, ensuring that project outcomes have real world applicability and relevance in agriculture. She is the program coordinator for annual North Meat Judging Conference and workshop and is passionate about increasing the participation, development and leadership capabilities of women across the agricultural supply chain. Um, I reached out uh, to Dr. Manning, uh, you may have seen in the media around a program she's working with AMPC on about uh, getting into school education and um, changing the perception of working in the industry and the type of roles that are available. Um, so I think that's very insightful and some really good stuff happening in that space to come. Jamie's gonna be speaking to us about getting change happening. So looking at what the latest research says about teachers' perceptions of working in the red meat industry and the career pathways for students can helping teachers think differently about the impact of the future um, does that impact meat sector careers? So thank you and welcome, uh, Jamie.
Thanks, Catherine. It's an absolute honour to be here and definitely huge shoes to fill um, following Georgie um, and Susan. And I guess a couple of the different themes that they've already touched on um, hopefully will come through um, in the next couple of minutes. So we're sort of going to change tune slightly and now we're going to think more around some of these teacher knowledge um, and perceptions. If you can go to my next slide, Alex, that'd be great. But before we start, I just want you to take a moment and think when I, with, at the moment we're focusing on the red meat processing sector. And so when I mentioned the red meat processing sector to you, there's going to be different thoughts or perceptions or words or concepts that come to you and whether that's around the sector in general, or maybe some pathways or careers. And for a lot of you, it's going to be quite easy to say what the red meat processing sector is. Um, a lot of you are already involved in some shape or form um, in the meat sector. But it just think if I asked you as a teacher, you've got your teacher hat on, you perhaps don't have any connection or knowledge to agriculture, and I ask you the same question, is your answer going to be the same? So I'm going to show you some data, um, some prelim data for a project that we've got that's involved with ANPC, Australian Meat Processing Corporation and CQU. And on this next slide, we ask the same question to this um, cohort of teachers. And for a number of them, they're able to say successfully that yes, the red meat process sector um, is associated with an abattoir. Um, we're at the Northern Meat Judging Conference only two weeks ago and asked the same group of um, cohort who are already involved in agriculture the same question. They could easily say yes, value adding abattoir. But for a number of teachers, they couldn't identify what this sector was. And so if you click to the next part, there's sort of three different um, answers that we got. They either associated it with the butcher, so everything post-production, um, selling meat, supermarket. Um, they associated with the pre-farm gate um, activities. So to them, they were thinking it was more around the monitoring and management of animals. And for a number of them as well, they thought that it was more around the entire supply chain. So it was from paddock to plate. And whilst that's not completely incorrect, what it does highlight to us is sort of a huge issue when we think about how we address whether it's workforce shortages, um, telling our industry what the red meat processing sector does, the different pathways, and career opportunities that are available for students if teachers can't, first of all, identify what this sector is. And I'm sure if we ask the same question more generally around what careers are available associated with the meat sector across the spectrum, we're going to see a similar issue as well. I'm going to go to the next slide. I guess the, one of the interesting um, parts um, of these teachers that we interviewed, and this is probably the most interesting part for me, was all around the connection to the red meat processing sector. So for some teachers, they weren't able to identify what the red meat processing sector was, but that didn't necessarily mean that they didn't have a connection to this sector. And so for one teacher, that quote that, that, that is there is I automatically think of our big abattoir just outside town or their specific town. And for this particular the teacher they didn't teach agriculture they didn't perceive themselves to have a connection to agriculture they taught drama but to them just the presence of a local processing plant or an abattoir in their community was enough for them to say of course I'd recommend that to my students it has such a big presence in my local region it's a huge employer has jobs um, of course I have a positive perception for that and whilst I found that quite interesting was because that alone can be quite useful when we think about how we engage with both teachers and that next generation workforce is that the presence of an abattoir processing plant um, in a local region, perhaps it's some connection to a family member or a friend that works in the sector, or just that involvement um, with a processing plant with local community. Maybe they sponsor a sporting event. Maybe they host schools um, to or visit vice versa. And so that connection to the sector, and this also applies to agriculture more general, is really going to play a huge part in how we start thinking about how we encourage people to consider a career in our sector. We just go, the, yep, 
So then obviously we're thinking about this next generation workforce and there's a couple of different things if we think about in terms of um, National Farmers Federation plan for our $100 billion industry by 2030 and what we need to do to address that and to what we need is suitably qualified and skilled workforce and this is especially in digital agriculture and so we start to think about all the different types of jobs that we're going to start seeing emerging over the next decade or so. A number of these jobs currently don't exist. We're making all these different technological advancements, but how do we make sure that that future workforce is sort of qualified, equipped and knows um, what they need to do in order to move into that sector? And this also aligns with ANPC's aspiration for this sector to be seen as a diverse, safe and attractive industry of choice of employment by 2030. So how do we actually attract that next generation workforce to our sector? And most importantly, if we click to the next one, will that next generation workforce have those skills and knowledge? And so to think about this, this is why we really need to start thinking about teachers. If we go to the next one. So why are we actually focusing on teachers? So we know that teachers are a key influencer of student career pathways and impact a large number of students. So if you think about say a secondary school teacher, they've got 20 to 30 students that they're seeing in that class. They're teaching several different classes. So their impact on that number of students is quite high. They're also seeing them on a daily basis. And so the conversations that they're having are gonna have an impact around those students' perception and knowledge of different industries. These teachers also determine the content or the industries that they include in their teaching programs to meet curriculum outcomes. And obviously this is gonna vary depending on teachers and schools and different states. But ultimately these teachers are facilitating that conversation. And it sort of goes back to what Georgie was saying, when we sort of talk to people, how we get heard and have that conversation. If you're not confident in a topic or don't have any knowledge in it, you're not gonna bring it up. If you go to a conference and you walk up to someone, I'm not gonna approach a topic that I don't actually know anything about about or I'm not comfortable with because you're going to ask a question and I'm not going to know the answer and so you've got to think about these teachers that might not necessarily have an agriculture background don't have any awareness and we're focusing right now on the red meat processing sector so of course it's not actually going to come up or come naturally to them to come up in conversation. And the re last reason why we focus on teachers is that we think back to if you sort of whether it's several years or several decades or whenever you went to school, there's sort of two teachers that probably come to mind for you. You've got that teacher that had a positive influence on your life. So they told you and have had a quite a big impact in why or where you ended up to, to today. Or unfortunately, maybe you had a teacher that had a not so positive um, representation or perception of our ag industry and incorrectly told you that there was no pathway for you in agriculture and to consider something else. And so again, there's these different types of teachers that are having this conversation with students. Some data I wanted to share with you, and Georgie um, touched on this, it's one of our projects that we've got in collaboration with Ag4 School to Industry um, Partnership Project program called Kids to Farms, which is all around getting primary school students out of the classroom and on farm to see where their food and fiber comes from. And we've got some data from teachers because these teachers really can change the discussion that we're having around careers for these students. So this was really more an immersion activity. It was one point in time, we only had these teachers for less than a day, but over 81% of these teachers post participation either agreed or strongly agreed that participating in the day increased their appreciation into the value of agriculture in Australia. 72% of them either agreed or strongly agreed that they're now gonna look for more opportunities of whether that's increasing their confidence or knowledge or how they can incorporate some of these concepts into their teaching program. And 64% of them noted that participating in the activity increased their knowledge of food and fiber concepts. So really to start this conversation and think about that next generation workforce, we really need to start thinking about teachers and how we can increase their knowledge and awareness and confidence to start teaching about a range of agricultural concepts. 
So sort of next steps, um, last week with AMPC, we released our national teacher um, survey and the link's there and I encourage all of you to share it around. And this link is, um, or survey is open to both primary and secondary school um, teachers, those that teach ag, those that don't teach ag. And what we're really hoping to gain is to gain more information around um, how that conversation, especially about the red meat processing sector and careers, if this is facilitated in the classroom, what are the different supports that teachers need um, or what are some of the barriers to implementation and ultimately for this particular project but for all of our other projects that we're involved with as well is all around how we develop some hands-on evidence-based activities for students and it really is around evidence-based and interactive it's more than just creating a handout and posting it on a website it's how we can immerse these students um, into agriculture and show them all the different pathways that are available for them and the range of skills that we need need for that next generation workforce. The last thing's all around how we strengthen industry teacher partnerships. So we can't just put all everything on a teacher and expect for them to sort of go out, make all these connections, upskill themselves. We really need to think about how we strengthen both industry and teacher partnerships to have a two-way partnership to address this issue. And one of the quotes that sort of sums this up perfectly is I think the most effective thing that's going to get kids into the industry is talking to people in the industry. And again, I think that quote um, sort of um, ties in quite nicely to what Susan and Georgie were talking about, again, about how to get heard and how to talk to people and how we get our message out there. So that was a very quick snapshot just to one particular project, um, but really wanted to get you thinking about a different perspective when we think about um, that next generation workforce, how we engage with them, some of the different concerns that we're already experiencing now, and how we address some of the different skills um, and requirements that we're going to need for those careers of the future. Thank you so much, Jamie. There's a few little um, questions and comments already popping into the chat box. So I'll just start uh, work my way through. I just wanted to ask, first of all, there was a pre question that came in around um, connecting with teachers and how you go about it. I've just, for everybody, I've just actually popped the link in the chat for that national survey. So if you know teachers or education, if you want to grab that and share it around, please do. Um, but connecting, of, um, is there already curriculums in place that yeah you, I think you know you know where I'm kind of going like how do you get into that curriculum to kind of get that on the agenda it's a really messy space and it varies state by state um, so the leader is more New South Wales so we've got projects in New South Wales Department of Education where it's actually mandatory for their year seven to eight students um, called technology mandatory um, to start um, incorporating agriculture in their curriculum it is in our Australian curriculum but it really depends on that individual school and whether they actually offer agriculture as an elective especially um, that doesn't mean we can't start the conversation earlier on so for a lot of the primary school teachers that we interviewed they said oh we don't really talk about careers um, that's up to the high school teachers but if you look at the data that's out there we know that that conversation starting at a primary school level and so we just sort of skip over that and go oh no wait to high school to make your life decision we're sort of missing an untapped cohort of students to make, really I guess raise their awareness that there are lots of different jobs in agriculture and there's more than just becoming a farmer we need people on lots of different skills, whether you're in a capital city or in a regional community, um, there really is a place in agriculture for you. So it's really how we start getting that message across and working out how we can tie some of these concepts to certain parts of the curriculum just to get that message through. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, Kiri's just made a comment saying that she had a fantastic careers advisor once who actually further steered her into ag. She had no idea there was an animal science degree existed uh, before he showed uh, her and she was considering zoology uh, instead. So didn't know that uni courses that included with animals uh, more specifically. So I guess careers advisors in those spaces are also very good um, tapping into yeah and there's so many different careers out there as well and so I guess if you're a careers advisor that doesn't have any background or connection in ag it's not going to again come naturally to you to recommend that um, and so again we need to think about not just the teachers but whether it's career advisors and for some schools they don't have a career advisor so it is that teacher that is having that conversation with them that there are career opportunities in our sector yeah 
Julia said that her children's school in Ballarat uh, had an ag industry breakfast facilitating oh, nice. students that were talking to people in the ag sector, which was very positive. So that's another great um, idea of actually, you know, getting your own little event or school, something happening, even if it's not on the curriculum, it could be something to tap in. And a lot of the time for those events, it's a really active, whether it's an ag teacher or a PNF um, association, there's someone there that that's really um, important to them. And I guess everyone that's online right now, we all care about this area. And so maybe you are that missing connection for the industry and the school. And so I really encourage you to think about how you could perhaps um, facilitate that connection or whether it's sending an email to your old school about hey I now work in this sector do you have a careers day that's coming up that you might want someone new or do you have an ag program or would you like to bring your students to my workplace there's lots of little things that we can all do to help that conversation really really good tips uh, Blair has made um, a note as well uh, Blair hi Blair over in uh, Harvey Beef in WA uh, saying that there's a lot of stigma still around processing plants at the moment so she agrees that it needs to start with culture and awareness to turn it around so there's some pretty good tips tips there uh, Kelly has said I've been involved with SIPP for many years forgive me I don't know what that acronym is well that's our school um, to industry partnership program through AgForce Thank you. Uh, you can see this topic happening in real time when you get involved with the teachers and kids groups on the ground and see ag in action. Uh, let me see if there's another question here. Uh, someone from Mudgee, as a meat processor, butchering facility for paddock to plate style, home deliveries throughout New South Wales. Uh, farmers, are there resources you can provide us with if we want to put our hand up to attend local careers days at our local schools? Mm, so you've got a couple of options. You could just approach local schools directly. Um, we've got a project that's called Excited for Careers in Agriculture that just got released um, a couple of months ago. And a big part of that is really around sort of these um, career industry um, so they're calling it, calling it speed dating, but it's for industry and um, career advisors. So if you are interested, um, please either send me an email or get in contact with our wider team at ageducation at cqu.edu.au. Um, we've got lots of teachers Australia wide. So even if you don't have a connection with a local school, more than happy to help facilitate that conversation and go, how could you be involved in one way or another? Great. And thank you, Georgie, for popping the link in there for SIPP. Um, teachers also have an effect on the diets of our children. We could talk about this topic for so <laughs> long. <laughs> Almost doesn't it feel like we need to have another whole forum um, on this, maybe at the face-to-face -face around not only impacts on climate, impacts on dietary nutrition. I mean, the meat industry has so many levels in, in that space. Um, has there been any studies on the effect of teachers on children's diets just on that topic? Oh, good question. Not that I know of. Um, I guess the issue we have in research, especially with students, is most of the time it's like one point in time. So we either have data where we um, ask some questions before an activity, get information after, but we really struggle to, I guess, um, tr um, track those students over time. And so it's really hard to say that this one immersion activity or that one conversation or uh, one activity a teacher did is going to um, attribute to their decision five, 10 years down the track. So it's really hard to get that information. But I do think regardless of that, we do need to consider how those conversations with teachers are actually going to have um, an impact on students, whether that's about eating meat or climate change or environmental considerations in ag. Um, we, we've heard lots of stories around how teachers who might not necessarily have um, the right perception or knowledge um, are portraying that onto our students. Yeah, exactly. And um, I was chatting with MLA last week at the Farm Riders um, lunch. Jason Strong, their MD, was chatting and uh, they were talking about that they've actually got some education, school education tools around nutrition. Shout out if there's some people from MLA on here, um, which is great. So uh, there's some comments in here as well around that even if children don't take up a career in the industry, it's very important that they're educated in the benefits of a balanced diet and the importance of beef. And I mean, I had a journo contact me the other week saying that there were a couple of schools that were going to go meat free one day a week and they wanted to get our 
comments around that as a meat industry and nutrition and I've kind of pointed in an MLA's way. So it's definitely something that needs a lot of change right down to that public facing um, viewpoint around the industry. Um, thank you so much again, Jamie. Um, we're going to, um, if there's any other questions, feel free to pop them in and I can facilitate that later. We're going to move into a bit of a, a forum um, with a couple of little questions just for a, a little discussion here. Um, the late, this kind of came about, and I'm just going to say a thank you to um, who's on the call here, Sue Hardman from Hardman Communications and Alex in her team, uh, who has supported um, Meet Business Women in pulling this program together. They've put together a little bit of a forum discussion for our Food for Thought as a collective of women in the industry here around how many women should be in the meat sector. Is 50-50 is split enough? And would it be better if it was all women? This has come about uh, from a question. The late US Supreme Court Judge uh, Ruth Ginsburg was asked how many women would need to be on the Supreme Court for it to be enough. And she famously answered nine, which is all of them. So a little discussion here um, that I'll uh, help to facilitate. And I might just, on the first question around how many women should be in the meat sector, feel free to pop in the little chat, but I might just work around our three speakers. And um, Georgie, I may start with you on that first question. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> I just, I love Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her, um, the courage of her convictions and um, Susan touched on this as well I mean I've been I've been really involved over the years in actually advocating for women and there's been times when um, I guess I've been accused of being quite a, a feminist and um, and had quite a bit of negativity from rural people but I believe passionately that um, we absolutely need to reach 50 50 um, and what would be wrong with a, with it being all women um, and I, and I really feel we have to continue to strive for this, that the difference of thinking you get in a workplace and um, in a community and around a board table when you've got um, more women involved is just, it's just incredible. And I've seen it happen. So uh, absolutely, we need to reach 50-50, but let's go for more than that. Senator, Susan. Well, I, I guess, like I said in the um, uh, in the uh, my presentation, was that I think the diversity of views is the important thing. Um, but certainly, having the low percentage that we've got now means that we're not accessing that diversity of views from women, from regional, from city, young, old, people with children, people without, all those different things that allows us to better connect with our customer uh, and society for our social license. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I would be uh, reluctant to say uh, all women because I think then we'd miss out on the men's point of views, which, um, you know, I really celebrate the approach of not caring so much about the detail, whether the house is clean, you can leave, all of that stuff that sometimes ties me up. So uh, I think that we do need, though, many more women involved, uh, leadership and management levels as well as um, the broader jobs, uh, because it allows us to make better decisions. Jamie? I think sometimes we get caught up on numbers with some of this, that we have to reach a certain number or a target, um, and we sometimes lose the message of what we're trying to get out there. And so definitely we need more women in our sector. But I also think that we need to think about the types of backgrounds um, that different perspectives of people are having in our sector. Um, so it's not just people that grew up in ag. Um, personally, my family has no connection to agriculture at all. I was sort of one of those people, one of those people that sort of stumbled across it, um, was interested in animals, thought I had to become a vet and then didn't get the marks to become a vet and was lucky enough to do a degree that was very much livestock focused um, and merge my way into it that way. And I do think we need to consider how we engage with a variety of different people and backgrounds um, and also getting more women into our sector as well. Right. So you've, I think most of you have kind of covered all three of those little topics there around the 50-50 split and would it be better if it was all women? And I think there's some good balance, particularly around what the Senator mentioned um, in terms of, you know, you need all the, all the perspectives. 
Um, is there any anyone on this? We've got about 90 participants all on the forum at the moment. So um, if anybody would like to put some little comments in or um, continue any of the questions, if you'd like, while well, we've got our three speakers here on any of the topics that they talked about, um, feel free to uh, pop some comments in the chat. Looks Catherine, like I think it's a, a great point there about diversity and I think diversity of view and I think diversity of background and I think, you know, Australia has an incredibly um, diverse cultural um, heritage and migrant heritage and we need to really ensure that we're starting to engage that. Uh, I love to see different ages, you know, different generations are thinking very differently now. Um, so. Mm -hmm. if, if I think I suspect in the red meat industry, we end up with quite with almost sort of um, we do actually have a lot of migrant um, workforce, but they may yeah. not be at the decision making level. So how we engage diversity um, of background as well as, you know, di diverse cultures alongside gender diversity, I think are really critical things and age as well. Um, I was given fantastic opportunities in my 20s and I really encourage anyone who's um, younger in this audience to ask for opportunities and to seek out mentors. You've got a mentoring program through Meet Business Women, absolutely tap into it. There's also one happening through the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation that you'd all be eligible for. Tap into mentoring opportunities um, because that will open doors and they will know um, of opportunities that you won't even know about. Um, and it, and it will build your relationships and strengthen your networks. Absolutely, um, Georgie, that's a really good point around the diversity is not just gender, it is wider. And the next um, gender representation report that's been done by Meet Business Women is expanding to cultural um, and age diversity as well, which is great. So we can start to see some of those numbers happening. Um, let me just do a quick little scan. Alex is done. Carolyn um, Ameni, we've achieved a 50-50 split out of our workplace of 10. Very good. Uh, what do you think the current barriers are that are preventing this? Uh, thoughts of the panel? Uh, you may, I'm assuming she means preventing the, um, that split that we've currently got of it being very male uh, heavy. What do you think is the causes of that? Might start with um, Susan this time. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a couple of things. Um, the first is putting up your hand. And Georgie made that point of somebody saying that at a forum, you know, men would come forward with their business cards and women wouldn't. When I was running my business uh, and I wanted to have more women um, uh, as two ICs and managers of the stores, and I started asking them to, um, to put their, um, to apply for jobs, um, I would get a long list of reasons as to why not, you know, and whereas the, you know, the men were much more open to applying uh, early. So I think one is is uh, that process. That women often think they need to be uh, overqualified or or, qualified or to have done the job to apply for the job, uh, and that's not the case for everybody. Um, the second is is making sure that we bring other women around with us. So. When I left the AMIC board uh, here in Queensland, um, I made sure that another woman came on in my place. Uh, and I think that's um, another part of it is that we, um, you know, it's, it's no good being, you know, the woman who's come through and they say, oh, yeah, we've got a woman doing that. Well, no, it, we're just the first. So uh, I think that's another element. Um, and then the final one is, is that, uh, people tend to ask people to take on uh, board roles, management jobs, uh, people that they know, they have a connection to. And again, um, if, if you don't come forward and make those relationships uh, with men and women who are, you know, in the position to make those appointments, uh, then you don't have those relationships. And so a part of it is networking too. Um, I used to find that when I started in work, there was a lot of meetings after the meetings, meetings before the meetings, uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, lunches and, and dinners and golf and, and things that I would not necessarily be invited to. And so it forced me to think a bit more about how do I 
um, engage with those, you know, how do I build relationships with those decision makers um, that, that, you know, meant that me and other uh, women would be front of mind. Yeah. Jamie? You know, I'm coming from more from a student perspective, um, and you've probably all heard the saying is you can't be what you can't see. And so for a lot of these students, they're not actually seeing females or women in these different roles. And so how can we possibly aspire to those people or to those job opportunities if you're not actually seeing it? And so, again, that sort of comes back to how we engage our industry with education teachers students and I guess make um, all these different roles that a lot of us are quite successful in and showcasing that to that next generation and all those opportunities for them yeah Georgie I think they're really good points that Susan and Jamie have made I'm just thinking about Jamie's one I looked at the ICMG judging the other day and just thought how many how much it's changed in sort of 10 15 years and um, and how much that's been a pathway into the meat industry for young women as well. So I think we've got to get better at profiling uh, the women who are doing things and talking about them. <clears throat> I think, it, it, look, it, it's, it's never easy, but you've just got to keep building your connections. You've got to be prepared to have the conversations. And if you feel strongly about what you want to do and where you want to be, then I think you'll find the courage to do that. I think in this virtual world, it's actually easier to reach out and set up some of those meetings than actually having to walk up to them at a function. Um, so I'd, I'd really, I guess my challenge to all of you is sometime in the next week to try and reach out and make a new contact of someone who you have wanted to start a conversation with um, and challenge yourself to do that sort of thing. Actually set some targets for yourself about conversations you want to start, people you want to meet. Identify the people or the organisation you want to get involved in. Remember going to something... Um, which it was Women on Boards, which is a great organisation. If you want to get involved in board work, Women on Boards are doing really good work um, both in, in the city and in regional areas virtually. And they said to me, well, what's the board you want to get on? I went, well, I want to do board work. And they said, well, no, we, we expect you by the end of the session to be able to articulate a board. So you need to have clear in your mind what is the impact and the and the um uh, that you want to have and how do you want to be involved so I think think about the letter you want to write to yourself next Christmas what is it that you want to achieve in your job what impact do you want to have on the industry um, what are the conversations you want to start and just it's just for you but it gives you some definition around the things the steps you're going to need to take if you want to be more involved in things um, and look from my points you need to turn up you need to speak up um, we do have things like elections in a lot of our industry bodies. You've actually just got to have a go at them. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? You go back to your job, um, but you've got to have a go at some of these things. And look, reach out to, to people like us who are happy to support you. There are some great women in the chat. Um, you've got an incredible group in Meet Business Women. Um, so really tap into the mentoring and, and think about what is the impact that you want to have. And further to Georgie's comment, if you're not sure what opportunities are out there, just look around you and ask that cohort around you. And whether it's connecting, like Georgie said, to someone on LinkedIn and or looking at their resume and seeing what professional development opportunities or groups they joined, um, just really just open your eyes and look around you because there's all, all those people in the chat and all the people that are here today, mm -hmm. um, every single one of them um, has a good opportunity or a connection um, and will be useful for your future. And I think, Jamie, along with that, and that's why I sort of um, suggest you think about what is it you want to achieve, because not everybody wants to be Senator Susan MacDonald and not everybody wants to be the president of Ag Force. So what is it that you want to do and what's the impact you want to have? Because that's the, that's the crux of it, because when you know that and you feel comfortable with that, it'll really help you work out your pathway. But it's quite difficult to go and buy the map for the country you want to visit if you haven't decided what country it is. And lots of people can help you and give you directions if they know where you're heading. But you personally have got to work out what it is. And the, I talk about legacy quite a bit. What's the legacy you want to leave in 10 years' time, in, in 30 years' time? Um, what do you want to look back and think, this is what I did? Can I that? I spoke to a 35-year-old woman this morning who said, I just still don't really know what it is, I haven't found my passion, my purpose. And I said, well, that's okay. 
because you know um, being an accountant isn't everybody's idea of a of a good time um, and it's certainly not not the thing that I was excited about but I was excited about working in businesses and helping business grow and and the people around me. And I never said no to an opportunity. Um, in hindsight, I should probably have been a bit more considered about, you know, you can't take on too much at once. But, you know, if you throw yourself into what you're doing, every day doesn't have to be your life's passion. So long as you've had a good crack at it, um, you've done your best, uh, then all working towards something, you know, your brand and your, your legacy about, you know, who you are. This topic, uh, it's the same kind of questions that come up or comments that have come up. I've come from a large corporate background, the quota versus the best person for the job. And there's been a few comments in the chat kind of leaning either way. Um, I would just, you know, in our last few minutes that we've got on this, I wouldn't mind doing a quick rip round on what your thoughts are around, uh, you know, having a focus on a quota number versus getting the best person for the job. Might start with who's ready, Susan. <laughs> yeah. So I would absolutely hate to ever have been appointed to anything as being a token chick. You know, hate with a burning passion. All I ask is that there's the opportunity for me to have a go and present. And that's what I've lived my life on is, um, is turn up, show up, be ready, be prepared, as Georgie said, have done your homework, uh, Jamie made that point as well about being, um, you know, thinking about where you're going. But, you know, that's all I ask is to have the opportunity to play on a level playing field because then I'm confident that me and, you know, so many other people who are on the forum today will get a go. But quotas um, are really dangerous because, you know, you'll end up with people. We, we went through this with the first introduction of quotas on boards where it allowed people to be uh, tagged as, um, uh, you know, perhaps not ready for the job that they got into. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of capable women around. We just have to make sure we're supporting them and promoting them into opportunities and then replacing them with women. You know, don't let that be the only woman who ever filled that role. Mm. Thank you. Jamie. I don't think I can add anything further to what Susan said. That was absolutely perfect and could not agree with it more. Um, yeah. I've got, no, she summed up perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Georgie? So the only thing I'll add to that is that when you get, when you get there, try and improve the system for the next, um, the next batch. So it's not just about women. It's actually also about young people and people from diverse backgrounds. And there's been some comments about unconscious bias in the chat. It's so true. So how do you actually influence systems internally once you're in a decision-making um, capacity? How do you select, um, you know, more effectively? How do you enable more people to come through? But you can actually change the system. What you inherit isn't what you have to leave. And too often I think we, we don't have the courage to change. So I would say be bold and be brave that when you get into leadership roles, don't leave it as you found it leave it far improved and much better for the next generation to come through. Thank you. Um, I'm just having another quick little scroll through here. Apologies, everybody. There's been some really good uh, comments and questions in the chat. So I apologise if I've missed a few comments uh, or questions. I think there's just general conversation. Uh, thanks, Joe. I've just put a little note in there. If people will come to, want to share their LinkedIn profiles, um, might be a good way to connect easily. Um, Catherine, can I suggest that you actually save the chat and maybe? Um, yeah, I will. Yeah, I'm looking at it now going, there's a lot of good stuff in there that I'd really like to um, go through further and get back to some people if there were some specific there's, questions that I've missed. There is a comment there about how do we... Um, how do organisations um, recruit more? And I think Susan might have something to, to offer on this around diversity and around welcoming difference. Um, some of the work, there's obviously diversity targets and those sorts of things that come through. Um, but I think this is where it's, it's really important that we all gain more skills in understanding um, around people and culture. There's a lot of discussion these days around culture in organisations. And if we're if we're leading teams, 
um, how we tap into the culture and how we make it a safe place. And the other conversation is psychological safety. And I think that women will be the first ones to step away if they feel psychologically unsafe, they will go and find somewhere else to work. So for us to make sure that our workplaces are psychologically safe for everybody, um, I think are really critical. And so open yourself up to some reading, some different podcasts. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good resources that you can find around these things, but I think they're going to be conversations of the future is that we're looking for flexible work workplaces and, and arrangements where we feel very safe to do what we do. Um, just, just adding that to that piece around recruiting. Yeah, there's a comment in here as well from Andrea Lethbridge around um, what is a good way of promoting women without coming across as tokenistic. Anyone, Jamie, you guys, any... Um... Well, there's so many different platforms now. Like we've got that luxury of there's so many different ways that you can communicate with others and you don't have to be tokenistic. And so it's not just about putting a tweet and maybe Twitter's not your platform, like Susan and Georgie said. There's lots of other ways to get your message out there. And whether it literally is just picking up the phone, calling your old school, saying, I now work in this sector. Um, do you have a class that would like to learn more? Or can we link something to the curriculum with my current role? Um, could just be a meaningful way to get what you do out there yes it might only be to a small cohort of students but that can easily increase I think it's trying to work out what message do you want to get out there and what's the best platform and maybe not necessarily just posting the best photo where I'm looking perfect and I've done my hair today might not be the ideal message I want to get out there um, for me it's probably more those meaningful conversations or meaningful ways to engage with people yeah, and I think also storytelling is really powerful as well, authentic stories that people can relate to. We try and do it in profiles, member profiles, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, really good storytelling. And She Looks Like Me campaign, I really want to start reaching out for the Australian. All these people on here, you're probably going to get a hit up at some point um, to start doing that profile and storytelling. So it's not marketing yourself in a certain way, but it's promoting the industry in terms of the, putting the face to and the, the stories that come with it. Mm. We've got four, just four minutes left. So I might just, um, apologies if I've missed any comments, I um, will get through and look at those in the follow-up chat later. I'm just quickly scrolling down to see if there were any major. I think, I think we're good. Um, Alex, might just jump onto the next little slide. We've got a couple of events um, coming up. Thursday, the 26th of May, um, at 3 o'clock at Sydney time. Uh, we have Michelle Redfern, who's doing a masterclass on leadership at every level. And then also in June, on the next slide, we have... Uh, Delene Ray from OBE Organic, who uh, was on this call today. Hopefully she's still there. And uh, Lizzie McClymont from Morton Co. They're doing um, an open masterclass, which is you don't have to be a member to join this one on the 7th of June. We'll be sending out um, an EDM and some details on both of those events to you all so you can note it in your calendar if you'd like to join. I would uh, like to thank uh, our speakers today, um, Georgie Somerset, uh, Susan McDonald and Jamie Manning for your very valuable time. Uh, this has been um, a fantastic forum, virtual, as we said before we got on. We don't need to jump on planes to get together and, and catch up and share ideas. Um, we'll be doing a lot more of these on Australian time. Obviously, Meet Business Women was very UK and a lot of their masterclasses have been on UK times. So we're working together uh, with the committee on a number of speaker suggestions to um, get some more Australian speakers happening. And as I mentioned, we are going to start planning an October face-to-face -face conference uh, for Sydney as the last couple have been postponed uh, due to COVID. So fingers crossed we can remain um, post-COVID uh, post um, now. I um, would also like to say a huge thanks once again to our sponsors and supporters, uh, Margot, um, Margot Andre, Australian Pork Limited, um, and Julia Unwin and the team over there for coming on board, supporting, really looking forward to working with you and sheep producers uh, with Bonnie and Annie over there uh, in Canberra. Thanks uh, for you. Also, again, as I mentioned, Hardman Communications, thank you for your support in putting this event together today. Uh, amazing women and team over there, support that I desperately need. Um, we all work with very limited resources at times, and this is my second hat. I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, and I'm really uh, also thankful for the participants that came on and joined today and registered and gave up their time. Um, so thank you very much. 
This is recorded, so like any open free event, it will be available on the meetbusinesswomen.org website uh, in a week or so once I touch base with the team over there. So feel free, I'll shoot a note out when it's up online and um, feel free to share it with any of your colleagues that weren't uh, able to make it today. Um, I think that is it, 12.59, right on time. <laughs> um, thank you, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thanks, Catherine. Bye. Thanks, Thanks so Catherine. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. And Alex, just we'll do a stop recording. <laughs>